Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our viewers from around the world. Welcome back to the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. We have a terrific dialogue for you today. But before we move on, we want to learn about you. So the first quiz and the poll is how many Stanford Global Energy Dialogues have you participated in? And you have, including this one, and you have 10 seconds to respond. Okay. So most of you, this is the first one. Well, uh, we hope you join us again two weeks from now, but we'll come to that later on. Um, so just to get us started now, um, let me just say some, uh, offer some opening remarks. We're living in extraordinary times. Since the beginning of 2020, the world has changed dramatically. We are not only in a new phase of the global pandemic, but we also find ourselves in a continuing economic crisis. There is intense focus on developing a vaccine and make it widely available, which optimistically could happen sometime early to mid 2021. Until then, most people will stay and work from home and only essential businesses will be open. This underscores the importance of electric utilities that deliver energy to our homes and small businesses. In addition to the demands of the current pandemic, this industry is going through some unprecedented long-term changes as well in customer choice and the electric grid. So to understand this moment in history through the lens of the energy industry, we have two very special guests joining us for today's dialogue. Paula Gold Williams is the president and CEO of CPS Energy, the largest municipally owned energy company in the United States based in San Antonio, Texas. CPS is involved in power generation and also serves more than 840,000 retail electric customers and 350,000 natural gas customers. Thousands of miles away in Sydney, Australia, is the headquarters of Origin Energy, one of the largest energy retailers in Australia, which serves about 4.2 million customers. In addition to energy delivery, Origin has businesses in electricity generation and in the natural gas supply chain. We have with us Frank Calabria, the CEO of Origin Energy. Despite the geographical separation and the differences in governance and customer choice that CPS and Origin are individually facing, there are some remarkable similarities between them, which we will explore and highlight in this dialogue. After my discussion with Paul and Frank, Paula and Frank, we will have a Stanford PhD student, Siobhan Powell, who will ask a few questions. Thereafter, we'll open it up for a question and answer with you all, the audience. So before we start, let's get it set up for the next quiz and poll. Since the beginning of COVID-19 2020 lockdown, which country has seen the largest percentage reduction in electricity demand? USA, Italy, China, India, Germany. You have 10 seconds. Okay, let's see if you can get the results. 31% um, said USA. The answer is not USA, it is Italy. According to recent report from the International Energy Agency, the largest percentage reduction has been in Italy at about 28%. Next is India at about 23% reduction. All right, so let's get started. Paula and Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we discuss the long-term trends in, in the energy sector, let me start with the impacts of COVID-19 in your communities. Give us a snapshot of what you're seeing. Let me start with Paula and then we'll go to Frank. Uh, Rune, I wanna, I wanna quickly answer that question, but I wanna thank you uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'm excited to be here and talking to Stanford students and supporters and anyone who is interested in the topics that we have now. I've been in this industry for uh, going on 16 years. When I entered it, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, you know, force people to talk about energy. And um, we are excited to have more people, more students um, joining us. Uh, all that said, you know, the discussions that you had around the, the disruption in the industry that is extremely exciting the evolution that we're going through was already a big deal um, before COVID. And then to watch uh, a global pandemic 
uh, move as fast as it did. The velocity of it uh, and, and the extent of it has been tremendous, especially in the United States, um, in Texas, and in San Antonio. Uh, we were one of the first places to uh, support um, people who had been originally affected on boats, ships. And so we have a large um, medical um, a network here. Uh, we have a huge military uh, medical complex here. And so it is natural that our community um, reach, has been reaching out, trying to do the best to, to try to heal people from this um, terrible pandemic. For a utility, um, we are an essential service though. So no matter what the orders were, whether it was uh, Stay Home, Work Safe, which was the name of our local order, um, the utility company needs to continue to come to work and figure out ways to work differently. And uh, we're a 24-7, 365 business. We generate the power, transmit it, send it through distribution lines, and we actually serve customers. We sell the majority of our power to the San Antonio community, but we also sell about 15% of our capacity out in the ERCOT market. So the stability that we focus on is not just for San Antonio, but it's also for, broadly for the state of Texas. Um, it has been tremendous. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, a resurgence and a relapse. We did a lot to, to flatten the curve per se, but community spread and the controversy around um, wearing masks um, is, is playing out locally like it is across the globe, um, as you can see. Um, I'm wearing mine. I, I wear mine every day. We think it's the absolute uh, critical nature of doing uh, business. Uh, we we practice physical distancing. We don't talk about social distancing as much as we used to. It's physical distancing, um, safe work practices, but staying socially connected. And the ability for us to still connect and still talk about today and the future is critical. Um, I liken our journey to the old EDS uh, video. If everybody, if anyone wants to look at it, pull up EDS, and it's the image of rebuilding the plane while while flying it, and that's what it feels like more than ever in this industry. We are having to take our everyday processes and activities, our communication uh, approaches, which was very much dependent on in-person exchanges and move, move them to digital platforms, uh, we have to be careful on how we dispatch um, employees from their own home and not come through our service uh, locations. We have to, again, even push that technology all the way down to our skilled craft and union employees as much as we can. Um, the last thing I'll say is we, as we entered this process, we broke our company up into three groups. We have a blue team. The blue team um, primarily are the ones that work in the field. They're are skilled and craft employees. They have to be out in the field because that's where the work is. Um, and so it's, it's very um, customized work, things that they do. They go assigned to projects and they're out every day. Because they're out every day, I'm out every day. I go come into the office every day. I went to a construction site today. Our senior team um, goes in and out uh, to try to, to be supportive of our field employees in blue. Uh, we have a, a white team and the white team is the team that comes into the office on a regular basis. Uh, they normally have to be here because of the security around our energy systems. We have to make sure we're behind firewalls, NERC regulatory activities, our national, our national grid uh, and re requirements. And so they're, they're still coming in and um, we really had, we worked it out in terms of people doing what they felt was comfortable on top of the need. And so we negotiated that pretty much employee by employee basis. And then our last team is our orange team and our orange team are the, te are the, the people who now work predominantly from home. We have about 3,100 employees and about 1,200 of our employees work from home routinely. And so um, they're using digital technologies. It was a huge deal. I think we thought we couldn't do it COVID said you had to do it. And um, we, we established secure connections, technology, training, all those things in short order to get people to be able to work from home. And so, you know, COVID is the thing. And without 
you know, the, the vaccine being right in front of us, we're going to have to keep up our vigilance. And so we spend a ton of time telling, talking to our employees about don't, don't put your guard down, be careful when you're not even at work, when you're, when you're socializing, again, masks, even in your private lives are extremely important to keep you and your family members safe. So that's kind of the, the, on the ground perspective of how COVID has been affecting us or Th Thanks, Paula. We already have a question for you, but we're gonna hold off on that and we're gonna move to Frank. And Frank, tell us what you're seeing. How has uh, the COVID-19 lockdown affected you in, in, in your neighborhood in Sydney, Australia? Yes, thanks Arun and thanks Paula. Are there some really similar parallels um, uh, to Australia that to what you've experienced and what you've gone through? It all starts for us with um, protecting the safety and well-being of our people and that uh, really starts with um, how we continued to deliver reliable um, electricity, natural gas, and uh, we also have a, uh, an LPG, a propane business, where we deliver gas to customers in regional areas. And it all started with really about how do we do that safely? And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've been able to continue the reliability of supply. And that was our first and foremost objective. And you've articulated well, Paula, how that, how that occurred. Just um, probably one difference for people that are not familiar with the origin business, maybe relative to the CPS business is that uh, we have a retail business, we have a power generation business, we have a natural gas production business and, um, and a wholesale gas and trading and also a liquefied uh, and an LPG business. Um, what we don't have is the transmission lines. So one of the challenges you've encountered about getting onto the transmission lines, we haven't had to encounter. Uh, we moved um, 4,000 of our 5,000 people to work remotely within a matter of days, including all our customer facing people. So we really, we're putting in protections and uh, processes and protocols to ensure our power station and gas field and delivery workers for the LPG business could continue to do that. And I've been very pleased to see um, them be able to continue to do reliable supply of power. The second thing really was that um, the, the next thing really came about was really how do you support your customers? And um, we, we you very much understood that um, in the first lockdown in, a, in Australia that um, small to medium enterprise businesses, particularly in travel, food and services, were undergoing tremendous change. A lot of people were working from home. And so the industry worked together in accordance with the statement of expectations, but Origin moved early to make sure there were no disconnections, there was no default listing, and there was a range of support in place. I have to say at this point in time, it, it, it's worth noting that the Australian government's response was very swift, both on a public health and an economic basis. There was um, um, a lot of measures put in place, including what you would, what we call JobKeeper or subsidised wage program. And so there's been a lot of economic stimulus and support and, um, and that's continued to, I think, um, cushion some of the blow early in this country. And uh, we all know that that economic stimulus won't be there forever. Um, and as a result, we're now setting up to how we continue to provide that support. Uh, for those not familiar with the sort of economic impact in Australia, um, GDP has contracted to be, um, I think, by about 0.3% in March. Um, I think we're a country known for having not been in recession for something like 27 years, but it's contracted in March. Our unemployment in the March quarter reached or June I think reached about 7% and I think it's expect expected that we'll go to about 10% or towards 10% by, by December. Uh, from an from a energy uh, demand perspective to put it into context, when the first lockdown occurred, uh, some of those small to medium enterprise businesses demand went down as high as, uh, as low as sorry, 15, 20% lower. It was being offset by people working from home, about 5% higher. And as people have returned to work and a bit more than the, the, the net impact, I think at that stage may have been um, somewhere about 10%, maybe 10 to 15% down when you combine the two. Uh, that's reduced to be closer to um, about 5% down. In fact, it's probably recovered into our winter pretty strongly. And uh, just for information for everyone on the line that may not live in Australia, that um, we've um, obviously fared pretty well from a health perspective, but we've just had our second most populous state, Victoria, go into a stage four lockdown. So 
um, I think we're all living with the fact that there will be um, what I would describe as um, an ongoing, um, uncertain and a responsive environment that we need to, uh, to continue to uh, support our customers and people through. Um, I would say the ways of working, Paula, to reinforce your point, I think what's, what's occurred is amazing and I think um, we're going to continue to see some of those things preserved into the future beyond, beyond COVID-19. Well, thank you to both of you for providing really the lifeline for all the people that you're serving. And, you know, at this point, we'll come to the resilience and reliability issues. Uh, today, we're hearing, in fact, because of Hurricane Isaiah's uh, in the East Coast, about two point, more than 2 million customers have lost power in New Jersey, New York area. So this is, you know, you, you take COVID-19 and you add this on top, and this is a huge, of course, challenge for all of you trying to deliver reliable energy. So you, you have this COVID-19 going on, and then you have the long-term issues. So luckily, we'll have a vaccine, and we'll get back to some kind of a new normal next year. And we have this long-term changes that are going on, the energy transition. We are seeing coal-fired power plants are being closed or becoming stranded assets. Solar and wind are becoming the cheapest way to produce electricity and are being adopted in the grid. The grid was never designed for fluctuating generation, and yet we are now talking about 50 to 80% renewables. Rooftop solar is getting cheaper, and so are lithium-ion batteries, um, which will introduce two-way power flow in the distribution network. The distribution grid was never designed for two-way power flow. Electric vehicles are getting cheaper, and EV charging could become a large load that could stress the grid. And you need to go through this transition while maintaining reliability, and resilience in the energy delivery. So could you tell what are the changes you're facing in your community and how is it going? Let me start with Frank and we'll go to Paula. Yes, thanks Arun. Um, gee, the energy transition has a number of dimensions in Australia. And once again, just by way of background, um, as you know, Australia is a resource, um, has a resource abundance in this country, whether that's across coal, iron, or gas, it's been one of the key um, strengths of our economy over multiple decades. And so the, back, the background from where we come from is that the first key transition underway in our market is that um, we're moving from coal to renewables. We're not moving coal to gas to renewables. We're moving from, um, a, a, it's a significant transition um, from coal to renewables. Uh, our coal plant is generally aged, so there's not been a lot, any new coal plant built for many, many years in Australia, but that's been our key challenge. And what we're seeing really is over the last five years, uh, that first aspect of that transition is that we've got 4,000 megawatts of coal that have come in. We've had in the last five years, 7,000 megawatts of capacity of solar and wind come into the market. Um, the solar and wind has really come in initially through renewable energy target support that's forced coal out pretty rapidly at times. And our key issue associated with that is probably twofold. Firstly, it, um, it, it caused in one particular state um, quite a bit of system security issue because they were moving from not having enough, from having a lot of synchronous generation to not having enough. And we don't have an interconnected system to other countries or other states here. It's one sort of long stringy um, transmission system. So that's been, Initially, it was a security issue um, in one particular state, South Australia. We then had spikes in prices, not surprisingly, when you get big capacity coming out of the market rapidly, um, even though that supply has come in, we've seen that. And uh, really what we're now faced with associated with that is that the ongoing investment in renewables is continuing on a large scale. We have both solar and wind. And uh, as they continue to come in, our new challenge is not the influx of more renewables. That trend will be inexorable over time. It's actually the market signal and support and policy environment for what we call firming capacity to be invested alongside it. And in Australia, we'll need firming capacity across a range of technologies because we will not only need instantaneous response in seconds and minutes to respond to fluctuations in supply, we will need it for hours through the course of the day, as you can imagine, sun, solar, particularly coming in and out of the day. And we also have, not surprising, I think people would know we have very hot summers. So we need also duration of that firming capacity when we have peak air conditioning load over summer. And so we're very much going to see the 
combination of firming capacity. That's the key challenge is now reliability. And that will be a suite of technologies extending from batteries to pumped hydro to hydro to gas fired generation technologies. And we'll need all of those to work in unison. So that's probably our key thing on reliability. So that really is that coal, what I would call the coal to renewables transition. And people might ask, why is that different to the states? Uh, we don't have the benefit of very, very low gas prices that's making it a natural transition. And so a lot of the existing coal plant has a lower short run marginal cost. Now, obviously, we're in a different world in terms of commodity price for gas, but it means we're jumping straight from one to the other. And that trend will continue. The second key transition that's underway, and people may or may not be aware, is that Australia has one of the highest per capita penetration of rooftop solar in the world. It was initially stimulated 10 plus years ago by uh, subsidies. It was generally an economic decision um, for, for consumers, um, more so than what I would call a sort of a, 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 a renewable and climate decision at that point, although that was a supplementary effect. So we have 2.5 million Australians with um, rooftop solar. And, uh, and that has grown, it, it's only accelerated as costs have come down, even through the COVID environment, we're just not seeing that stop at all. And so we have a transition that has both, what I would say, the centralized and decentralized or distributed energy really rapidly changing. And uh, that will in fact mean that we've got to combine those two over time. Um, you did raise a ruin um, storage and EVs. Um, it's worth noting that Australia has um, is very low in penetration on, on electric vehicles relative to other markets. There's not um, been either city, state or government support for their adoption or acceleration in the market. But we do de definitely see that as storage costs come down, including the cost and functionality, and as you know, performance of EVs, that that will increasingly I believe, play into that distributed energy um, transition. I probably just raised that the last, the one, and I'm sure we'll cover this later, but the last transition is really what digital is doing to both our core businesses today, um, but also what that will do to future business models. But, you know, those are the three dimensions and, and, and certainly we're seeing um, the pace of that not, um, uh, not slow down. And so, you know, we have to really balance in our view, security, reliability, the reduction in emissions and, and affordability. And we've seen those get out of balance over the course of this journey. And that remains uh, a challenge as we go forward. Great, Frank. So uh, let, let me ask Paul the same question. Energy transition, big changes, long-term changes. Um, how is that going with you? Um, yeah, um, there are a lot of similarities with what Frank uh, has described, which I think is, it, it always amazes me. I've, I've been able to travel and talk to, you know, leaders in different countries and, and like the energy, the energy journey is for the globe. Um, I, I will say for San Antonio, I do believe in the concept of regionalism, though, because where you are and where you start from changes your journey uh, along the way. Um, to, to tie in the earlier question in this one, for San Antonio, it's, it's kind of a, um, a complex issue. We have served this community for 160 years and um, we're, we've been owned by the city of San Antonio for 77 years. So we're municipally oriented, but the demographics in our community are challenging um, we were recognized as um, kind of the, the one of the lowest, lowest economic uh, income levels for the average citizen in, in the United States and so of, of a large city. And so we have that, we have some educational challenges. So you already know right away that you have certain customers who are very price sensitive. And so um, it's, it's great to think about getting to, you know, the other side of COVID, but we had to, for example, stop what we were doing and create a whole outbound call um, situation where we now call customers to tell them about our programs. And we, we have some funds, we don't have a rainy day fund, but we have some funds that we are able to help customers um, get their bills paid but we also have our employees call them and tell them about the food uh, banks 
and the different United Way programs and different, different types of assistance. Some of our uh, customers don't have computers. There's the digital divide issue in San Antonio. So our energy advisors, those are the people who are on the phone, they will look up websites and names and information to try to give people that, that uh, information that they need and try to help them direct them where they are. So this, this period between now and, and sometime in 2021 is a very concerning um, one. We have suspended disconnects. We have, um, uh, we, we will take off late fees if we can get people on a payment plan and we will constantly work with them through this period. Now, you know, very similar to what Frank says, we have, we have six guiding pillars um, that we utilize to serve customers today and help us make the right decisions going forward as we're going through the transition. So their safety, security, reliability, resilience, affordability and environmental responsibility. And as Frank says, it's hard to keep that stuff all balanced, but we know we have to do it as we make this transition. Um, we are diversified. We were years ago, completely 100% gas company. Um, today we do have coal. We did close two huge coal units in 2018, but we built one of the last coal units um, in 2010 and brought it online in 2010. So we have two. Now we use ultra low sulfur coal, we use scrubbers and environmental controls to reduce the emissions on those units. And they, they do fairly well in the ERCOT market. And so they're still, they're still producing and they're very efficient. But we also have gas, we have nuclear, we have a large amount of wind and we have a, um, an increasingly large amount of, of solar. So we have about a thousand megawatts of our almost 7,000 megawatts is wind and about 600 megawatts is um, solar. And, and to, uh, to Frank's point, those are utility scale um, megawatts. We also have increasingly more distributed solar on our systems. We've had a program since 2008. We have a huge energy efficiency and conservation program. I know we'll talk about that a bit later. And so we have embraced this transition for 20 years. We've, we've we brought in renewables in our portfolio. The transition is complicated. I mean, even when I'm talking to people who do say, you got to get out, you got to get out of coal tomorrow. And I, and I believe that our goal is to absolutely get to net zero emissions and ultimately net emissions. It's not that, that we are disagreeing with the objective. The complexity is the velocity of change and whether or not you can optimize technology again without making it shockingly financially difficult for customers in the transition. And so, you know, we are, we are trying to figure out how to balance it, how to make it work, and how to constantly put in, um, you know, more, more uh, investment in our systems. We went AMI over 10 years ago, digitization started to come into our systems, we're becoming more efficient, and, and our operating systems are coming more efficient. We continually look for ways to put in um, new low to non-emitting sources. We just released last week this, what we call the Flex Power Bundle. Our big strategy is called the Flexible Path Strategy. What it means is don't buy into the old solutions. Keep looking across the globe for new solutions and be ready for those. Think global, apply local. So the flexible path underneath it, we have the flex power bundle that was released and where we have about 600 megawatts now of solar. The general shape of the off the request is we want to get up to 900 megawatts more of solar. Um, we believe that the current lithium um, ion battery is proven and very effective, but, and, and it really responds well with renewal, renewables very promptly as Frank says, but you got to rack them and stack them. And utilities, utilities have to run them and deep cycle them. And, and so all of the optimization that people typically tout with batteries, we will use a battery probably like three times faster than what, you know, what, they're, what they're told uh, will last for life. And so for us, the economics is a lot harder because you almost have to take that in initial installation and multiply it by two or three. That makes it a whole lot more difficult to get the same level of performance over the life of what you would traditionally do in a fossil unit. 
So it's about, it's, it's a much lower um, target on this. It's up to 50, but, but we would be open depending on what advances in lithium ion are. And then again, as Frank says, the firming capacity is the key. We are starting to see more people knock on our doors with solutions that are non-emitting. We feel like it has to beat gas. Um, you know, for us, gas is abundant across the state of Texas, and then we have, we, we just have a huge source of it. And the economies between solar and gas have been so, so beneficial to affordability for customers. We need the performance and the reliability to be as good as gas. We need the pricing to be around gas. But, but, but we actually think it's coming. Just like solar prices came down, we see new prices coming down on new technology. So those transitions... We are constantly evaluating. We're trying to attract people to come into San Antonio and bring us those solutions. We can do it within our service territory, but we could do a lot of things anywhere inside of the state of Texas, just about. So, um, so that's the deal. I mean, we just gotta we gotta work on the velocity. It's not like snapping your fingers. It doesn't happen. It's a it's a very thoughtful process. Very complicated, high stakes, very expensive. I mean, the big difference is listening to you. The big difference that I'm sort of gauging is that in, in Frank's case, you're going from coal to renewables without going through gas because that's where you are. Whereas here, gas becomes the firming capacity for solar and, and wind. Where in Texas, you have a lot of wind as well. So, you know, let's just step back a little bit. Um, COVID-19, giant global experiment going on. Um, it's forcing all of you to do things, all of us to do things that we would never would have done otherwise. Coming out of this, you know, th this is a global crisis. And, you know, as we all know, we don't want to waste a crisis. So if you were to take this moment now and ask for one or two things to set yourself for the future, what would you be asking for? What, I mean, if you're bored, or your regulators or anyone, people who, who you know, you want to institute and you got to go and ask, what would you be asking for, Paula? Nobody ever wants to give me anything. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, when you work for the energy company, it's always, what can you do? Because you got to do something better. So you've totally stunned me with this one. But here's what I would say. I mean, um, the little bit I know about uh, what Frank has talked about, um, you know, their federal, their federal strategy, um, and, and nothing's perfect, but their federal strategy has been focused, and it's gone after incenting, right, incenting renewables, um, and, and, and that matters. Um, our energy federal policy, you know, has been updated in a really long time. And if I could do something tomorrow, it would be to create alignment across the federal, state, and local levels relative to the policy decisions and, and that we could align the, the uh, funding mechanisms. You know, a lot of folks say, you, if you set the policy, uh, it can drive the funding mechanisms. It could, but I think you just have to be thoughtful about whether or not you're you're doing them constructively or not. Now, some people say, well, just just change and mandate solar tomorrow. The problem with solar only solutions is is one of physics. It's yes, they're cheaper per megawatt or kilowatt hour delivered, but they're weather dependent and they're time of de time of day dependent. And so mandating things without creating the connection to the funding policy and really thinking through how do you want to transition people off of that? I mean, I'm, I'm basically saying if I can wave a magic wand to create alignment and synergy between that policy and the economics and funding piece, I think, I mean, that would be cr critical. I see, it, it seems to me that there is more of that in on the things that Frank is experiencing. And uh, for us, I see, um, splashes of it, but I definitely think that if we want to make huge um, advances, trying to do that together uh, matters. Local, regional, federal coordination, yeah. that's what you would like to see. Frank? Yeah, just firstly, the background and, and, and to, to, to build on some of your comments, but also, um, um, and also Paul, Paula's, is firstly, 
I think COVID's doing something. I think it's accelerating prior trends um, even more. So I think it's accelerating the transition in a number of respects. Firstly, uh, with a weakening in demand, um, I think it's accentuating, therefore, um, what we know as the duck curve in the middle of the day, therefore it's accelerating the challenge for coal to operate and therefore the price formations changing. And as a result of that, I believe it's going to bring those trends on faster. And I think that's the first. I think the second is that from a technology point of view, um, the digital adoption by our customers, um, the ways of working and use of technology I think more broadly, uh, I think is, is, has just accelerated, I think what would have taken months and years into weeks uh, and months. And so I, I think that's the first um, backdrop comment I'd make, Arun, in, is this whole acceleration of that transition for a variety of reasons. And for that matter, I think therefore, it's actually bringing, I think into starker light, what are the need, what are the things necessary for us to actually manage that challenge that Paul has done a nice job of articulating. Um, and certainly from an industry and government perspective, there's probably a couple of dimensions. Um, you're right, Paula, that we've had an incentive for renewables 10 years ago when the, the cost wasn't as competitive, but today that cost is as competitive. So we certainly see the increase in renewable coming. Um, so our key challenge is a little similar to yours in that we believe that you've got to integrate both the climate and energy policy such that it, it provides the right incentive for the investment in that firming generation because the key challenge now is really one of reliability through that navigating change in technology which is coming. And uh, we would think that that actually has, if that can be done in a coordinated way and gives the right settings for private investment into those, um, firming generation and rewards them appropriately, then what we'll find is that will smooth out that reliability challenge. And that's something that's upon Australia right now when we have aging coal plant coming out. Um, the second is that the government and industry has been really contemplating how does it, um, how does it focus on the economic recovery? And the reality is the governments and industry are gonna to have to work together. So I've just talked about that, that one of those challenges. The second one is in Australia, and I should just, um, highlight, Arun, that um, gas plays a critical role for Australia because of the firming generation, but it doesn't play a key role in baseload energy. So it's more of a capacity as part of that suite of technologies that Paula did a nice job of saying things have got to compete against gas as it goes forward. So it is pretty critical to the linkage of that and the economic extraction for that um, while other technologies come available. So it'd be really about the, the development of that and how we can see that that might also support manufacturing in parts of our economy as well. So that would be the other key area that government and industry are working through to see um, how, how, how we could actually help coming out of COVID from an energy industry perspective. So they're probably the, the key things. Um, I, I'm very excited by what this has done though in terms of from my perspective, the digital and other aspects that are associated with our customer journey, I really very excited that we can see that that's, um, that's accelerating rapidly and a, and a great opportunity for our industry if we, can, uh, if we can embrace it and stay ahead of that curve. Thanks, Frank. I mean, uh, what I've heard is that um, a, a term that was used that this is the dress rehearsal for, yeah. uh, for energy and climate. And when you're trying to address climate, this is really the dress rehearsal. So you, that's you exactly were, right. Your comments on uh, yeah, accelerating is spot on. So we're going to go into the digital, but here's quiz number three. With the world under lockdown, what is the expected reduction in energy-related global carbon dioxide emissions in 2020? Is it 5%, 6%, 8%, 10%? You've got 10 seconds. Okay, let's see the answers. Um, people said 8%. This is a very well-read audience. The answer is correct. It's 8%. Of the 2.6 gigatons of CO2 reduction, uh, reduced coal would contribute about 1.1 gigaton, followed by oil at one gigaton, gas at 0.4 gigatons. In fact, renewable adoption has, renewables use has actually gone up a little bit. The United States would undergo the largest reduction in CO2 emissions of about 0.6 gigatons. So, Let's move on to the next uh, question, and that is you alluded to earlier, and we briefly talked about it on, on this digital. And so 
you know, there's, there's a, there seems to be an understanding that to enable this transition in the energy sector, there seems to be significant interest in using digital tools for coordination, for control, aggregation of distributed services, system optimization, and just automation broadly. And then this is relatively new in the electricity sector, although widely adopted in other industries like telecom. Here at Stanford, we have started something called the Bits and Watts. It's a campus-wide initiative to look at not only the technology part, but also the markets, as well as the regulatory changes that need to happen, and sort of looking at the combination of, of technology and the electricity, and to really form a bridge between the information industry, which we are surrounded by, and the electricity industry. So in your opinion, what benefits do you see in the digitalization? Does it reduce your cost? Does it increase revenue? Does it create new services? Does it open up new, open up new business models? And do we need changes in the regulatory framework which were developed before the digital revolution got into the electricity sector? So let me start with Frank and then we'll go to Paula. Okay, thanks very much, Arun. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting things that's going to emerge. I mean, I think really those companies that can um, embrace both data and energy and bring those together and the digitalization that flows from that will be those that succeed going forward. And the reason we say that firstly is that if you think about just the transition I described earlier, um, the rise of intermittent renewable energy through the day, the combination of that with distributed energy assets, the flow of that, um, the the, the increase that will emerge increase uh, across the system in terms of distributed storage assets. And let's not forget an electric vehicle will be a storage asset as well. So we're, we're seeing that and combined with that, I believe the, um, the connectivity of devices increasingly through the internet of things within the home mean that we're going to have system, uh, power flows in multi-direction uh, between both centralized production of energy, but also through a distributed system. And, uh, and if you think about just the, 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 the increase um, in, in um, implementation of smart meters is in simple terms taken us from the dark age of four data points a, a year to 17,000. Then as you say, you'll have much, much more data points as you have more and more devices connected to one another. So I really believe, although we talked about a transition to renewables and distributed energy, this is really the third big one. And it's the one that's most connected to our customers. So firmly of the view that this is in fact, one of the big, the big trends um, in our sector that's already underway. To answer your question about what will that mean? Um, initially it means, um, I believe a customer experience and cost benefit. So even in the core business today, the way we interact with customers, the way we serve them, the way we sell to them, um, the way they can engage with their, their experience is becoming increasingly one where they understand their efficiency uh, as well as their customer experience. But what you've highlighted is that as this all comes together, it's going to convert now, I believe, into products and services and then to business models. And the role, I believe, increasingly, if you think about the energy company, historically, we were managing risk of um, supply and demand through the flow of generation right through, you know, transmission systems into the home. We're now actually going to do that across millions of assets that are distributed as well as that uh, that are centrally produced. And those that can actually um, provide that, I believe, will be the successful organisations going forward. Uh, what that does mean, though, I think it starts, and we should never forget before we get to the technological aspect, it starts with building trust with your customer. Because what, if you don't have trust, then you're, the prospect that you'll be able to aggregate and or manage that dynamically for your customers, I think you won't get through the first gate. So I think trust we should never forget is the first place. And, be, and citizenship, I think, as an organization is increasingly a source of competitive advantage that we must have and never forget about on the way through. Uh, but I'm very excited by the fact that, and we see this, and just for the background of people, we are a competitive energy market. We're not allowed to own the distribution and transmission assets. So we really do need to um, win our customers and retain our customers based on what we can offer them every single day and improving. And so we have a market setting today that enables us to offer those in a competitive market setting environment. What we would like to see is that those settings continue to reward 
And a good example would be things like demand management. Um, we've got virtual power plants, they're powered by AI, they're actually in real time um, managing assets for in, uh, our commercial and business customers. But also as you get into the home, it's going to be able to do that in a simple way. And uh, we see that that's actually one of the key trends that over time you'll be managing people's supply and demand, aggregating supply and demand of customers and offering products that are simple and easy for them um, that give them not only uh, the benefit of the assets they may have within their homes, but also within their community. Uh, but also what you're doing is you're, you're, you're optimizing the way they want to use their energy throughout time. And so the skills that we have really going forward are ones we're very much of can you actually manage that? Can you in fact harness the data and can you translate that into meaningful insights? It's one of the great, I think it's one of the great trends that will emerge um, and we're very excited to be part of that in the Australian market. Paula, what do you think about digitalization and how will it benefit you and your customers? Well, I, I strongly agree with Frank's um, thoughts. I mean, well before we got again to this period of you know, global pandemic, there was um, a huge discussion about utilities in particular as we try to think about smart cities and smart communities. And, um, and I think in, critically, that's gonna be part of our journey in trying to couple our traditional model with the evolution through utilizing technology. You know, Ruin, you said, you know, does that open us up for more par partnerships and work with tech companies, we absolutely believe that. Um, I've got a, a lot of um, uh, leaders uh, in, in different industries and, you know, they would describe themselves as becoming tech companies. You know, what I believe uh, is that, as Frank says, you know, we are, we are connected to our customers and trust is extremely important um, in the way that we serve them. And our core service is optimizing energy and optimizing solution sets that, that work towards them being able to, to harness power and energy. What we want to be is we want to be tech enabled and we want to optimize the, the talents that the tech industry has. And we think our ability to partner with anyone, particularly in terms of new technology, um, puts us in the best spot to better serve customers. We understand our customers, they understand the technology, let's try to figure out how to, how to optimize it. We're gonna keep a core amount of our um, digitization going so that there's a very secure environment. It's really important that the grid stay secure. You know, I ran through them very quickly, but one of our six pillars is the security around the grid and the data that goes around it. But we think there's a smart way to do it that optimizes that and it's absolutely critical. And the way that we look at this process, very much there should be a lot more um, digital solution placement at the operational end of our uh, services. Everything from our power plants, we need to, we're, you know, we're contemplating how do we change the whole control systems around there and again, still keep them secure um, and then make sure as we're adding new technologies that the operational systems that, that control all those assets allow us to make to respond quickly and use algorithms and then the, the talent and information again from tech companies that help us optimize our operation. Customers don't want to have to think consciously about every single transaction. Uh, technology should help that happen in the background. And then you push it through the continuum, more products and services, sensors, um, you know, services, better operations of systems, all of these things that can happen where you can bring in private and external investment into your community. And again, optimizing that partnership through putting more digital solutions uh, in the front. You know, we actually are, um, we have basically a, um, uh, slowdown of hiring. So hiring freeze mostly, but we decided that we were going to, we still have to operate and we still have to get through this period and we still have to think about the future. So we strategically thought about, well, what, what positions would we, would we invest in even in the middle of a pandemic? And I would tell you one of the ones that went to the top is 
our vice president of digital solutions. We, we needed to bring someone into our organization that thinks differently than we do, who, who has been in different industries and really can help us rethink, reimagine, rebuild the plane and being able to think about it from the customer's prism and also be able to think about it in terms of the back office, um, we think is one of the most critical areas. We were building up a team and then we brought in a, a, a leader to help us at, at the one of our top levels in the company. Very excited. He has a ton of emotional intelligence as well as the technical ability to help us rethink and reimagine that this journey that is important to embrace um, you know, those solutions. And, and the, you know, to pull it all full circle again, you're right, Arun, COVID has told us that technology is the way to optimize everything we do. Again, nobody would have ever, if you had told somebody that every single meeting that we would have for a period of time would be through digital solutions, and Frank and I would be here, uh, you know, talking about very similar and different, uh, different circumstances, through a digital solution base that is common, right? Zoom is common, WebEx is common, but this stuff is gonna get easier and better and that there's no reason to think that that's not gonna happen through the full spectrum of energy solutions. So, so it absolutely, it's critical for us to brace it, to, to tell our people to go in learning mode, to take folks with existing talents and grow those, to get new students that come in and help us think about how to do things differently and figure out how to move from where you are to where you want to be. So I'm going to move on to the student section, but before I do that, some quick answers for this on energy efficiency. I mean, this is often called a low-hanging fruit, yet it is one of the most difficult things to achieve in the retail industry because of a market failure. That is, increasing the electricity prices don't often reduce electricity consumption. And you know, reducing the price, uh, increasing the prices won't be fair to the low-income folks. So, it's, it's that, so it doesn't have any effect. So traditionally, energy efficiency has been achieved by regulations, so, you know, applying standards, building codes. Since you're dealing with customers on a daily basis, and so let me ask you, what incentives or business model innovations could you introduce to dramatically increase energy efficiency as, as opposed to incrementally doing it, which is what we are, I think, what we are doing right now with codes and, and applying standards, et cetera. Paula, you want to take a quick shot at this? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, actually, I'm always excited about energy efficiency and conservation. You know, we've had a very successful program that we launched in 2008. And um, for us, it has worked. Now, we what we did at the very beginning was realize that there are the considerations of cost and the considerations of different people across the spectrum in the community who need different types of help. Um, our most expensive programs are the programs where people can't contribute anything and they're not as effective, uh, let's say, as some of our rebate programs on the solar side, but that didn't matter to us. For us, it had to be a blend. We had to be able to make sure that we could weatherize homes on one end of the spectrum. We, we created a uh, solar lighting solution for customers that they don't have to pay for that we can couple with other other you know contribution programs and find ways to give people um, no cost no cost participation we created a solar host program where where a customer doesn't have to buy the system but they get a a rebate for allowing us to use their rooftop um, I, for us uh, economies of scale matters to be able to blend it matters we were able to reach 800 megawatts of energy saved. So we effectively got that, um, but we kept adding to the portfolio. We have demand response program that is very effective. It helps us manage not only the peak inside of San Antonio, but it helps us contribute to reducing the peak in the state. So it's a portfolio effect. And so I think that's, that's wonderful. Now look, because there's no federal aid that comes into that or state aid, it's paid for. Every single customer in San Antonio pays about anywhere from uh, $3.50 to about $5.50. So we're all paying into a fund, um, depending on you know, you know, what, you're, what you're utilizing, how many megawatts. And then those funds are available to those who want to elect into opt into these programs. And it has worked. Um, the, the whole thing, 
we saved $100 million, so it cost about $750 million, but we saved 800 megawatts of power. So we believe it works. Now, some people will come to us and say, well, that's, that's great, but to your point, Arun, what happens if you supersize it? What happens if you want to go after 2,000 megawatts of power? It, the issue is, as, the, as it becomes the investment of the community, 2,000 megawatts of power make it so that every single person has to contribute twice as much into the program to create the fund because, again, there's nowhere else. Is that bad? No, it's, it's really good. Most people, once they find out what, it, what, what works, they'll be willing to do that. However, in the middle of COVID, and so people are out of jobs. And so it's changed. It's, it's kind of slowed down the momentum, at least for, I think, the foreseeable next 12 to 24 months. But I think we'll be back at it, and people have to figure out what they're willing to pay for. Now, on average, most of our customers, we survey them all the time, they'll pay about $5. They'll say, I'll pay, regardless of their demographics, so they'll kind of agree to pay about up to $5 for energy efficiency and conservation. So it is... It's not that it's a failure. There's a value proposition that all people also put onto that program and you got to manage to that. And the good thing is prices come down the more effective that technology is. And so as long as you're moving your rebate money to come down as prices come down and you keep optimizing it for affordability, I think it's very effective. And for, until for us, we've seen a great deal of, uh, of success with it. Great. Thanks. Frank, so uh, qu quick thoughts on energy efficiency yeah. on steroids. What would you yeah, do? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think, um, firstly, appliances, lighting, they've all had an impact. Consumption's coming down, so those have all been effective. In fact, some ways, I think over the last decade, um, Arun, if you looked at really what really spurred on rooftop solar, as much as that might have not appeared to have been a, 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 an efficiency, nevertheless, people adopted that and they adopted in, in, um, in with quite some gusto because I think they were responding to that economic impact of energy and therefore how do they respond. And I think you're right, we have to be mindful about creating winners and losers and the least, the most vulnerable, for example, can't afford solar. So we can't afford to have those things going forward. Um, I think with the um, increase of, uh, just to extend the previous um, topic, I think there's really some exciting things that I think will happen in terms of the evolution of energy efficiency. And we're seeing that already now with demand management, demand response programs, um, whether they be with industrial customers that are rewarding those customers. Um, and secondly, now with the consumer, which really does center around the ability for you to actually be able to manage those devices and utilize and offer products and services that reward customers for that efficiency. Um, we've been working with a number of partners um, across um, and both the US, U UK um, in, in that respect. Um, and so we've established that AI powered um, demand response program where we'll have increasingly more and more devices connected to it. Um, one of the innovations around that actually is a partnership that we're, uh, just, we've entered into with a company that you may all know out of California called Own Connect, which actually gamifies demand response. And we think one of the key things as compared to industrial customers is how do you actually take advantage of really the key skills and capabilities of that organization in order for us to actually engage the customer into that ongoing management of their own efficiency that, as you all know, has a variety of rewards, not all of which is financial. It is financial, but it can also be that they'll actually invest back into energy efficiency devices and other, other programs that way. So we're excited to be launching that. Um, and one of the key things actually through those partnerships, just to really point out, um, Paula, is that we are really working with you know, lots of organizations and other ones into trust because how do we manage security? How do we manage um, cyber security? How do we build trust? So we'll definitely um, continue those programs. I continue to come back to trust and working with those partnerships, but I really do think um, that that digital enablement and engagement of the customer into demand management is actually one of the exciting ways forward that I think efficiency will take the next leap. Terrific. So uh, I'm going to get Shoban Powell, the PhD student at Stanford on board. But before we go to her, this is quiz number four. This is the last one. As of roughly how many, as of March 2020, roughly how many square miles were burned by the unusually intense fires in Australia? 5,000 square miles, 10,000, 50,000, 70,000. 
Okay, let's see the answers. Very well read audience. 70,000 is indeed the correct answer. 48% got it right. Over to you, Siobhan. Hi, thank you so much, Frank and Paula, for taking the time to take student questions today. It's really kind of you. Um, the first question I have is actually related to the fires about climate adaptation. So the question is, Australia faces wildfires while Texas faces tropical storms. What are some of the unique technologies or operating strategies your utilities have adopted in the face of these environmental challenges? And to follow up, how do you plan to adapt as climate change is expected to worsen the severity of these events? Um, and what can other utilities learn from your example? Yeah. Well, probably the wildfires are the, are the com, you know, conversation for the day. So I'll let you go first, Frank. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really pleased that you actually put a trivia question on Australia, but you've obviously also highlighted what a devastating impact that's had um, on our wildlife, but also on many, many communities. And I was raising just before this call that those communities have walked straight out of a, an incredibly um, difficult time straight into a pandemic. So it's been a tough year for those communities. There's probably two levels to that answer, Siobhan. Firstly, you talked about operating strategies and systems in place. Um, and, and really that's our preparedness about how do we reliably run our business while bushfire, in, in, with bushfires occurring. And I think there's no doubt that climate change contributed to prolonged drought conditions. I think at the same time, there was also government policies around backburning, but I think we've all learned so much and there's been a significant review. And the key thing for us really is how do we prepare ourselves? Because we had a couple of power stations that were very close to those bushfires. And so the first thing that we're focused on is how do we make sure they rely, operate reliably? And there's a very good preparedness program that goes in place. And, um, and the way we can also dispatch nearly all of our plant, I think with the exception of one, we can all dispatch and operate those plants remotely is also one of the advantages that we have. But there's a lot that goes into the actual management in those circumstances. That's at the operating level. But I think your question goes to a broader one. Um, and the broader one is really how are you managing um, the, uh, the climate change um, strategic issue or global issue that we all talk about. Um, firstly, at a high level, electricity generation represents about one third of the emissions in, a, in, in Australia. Um, and the other key emitting uh, sectors are both transport and agriculture. So we have a firm belief at origin that energy of electricity generation must do more than its proportionate share if we're to reach the overall targets. And so that's where we're very much focused on that. Um, and what we've done is um, set a strategy based on that that centers around a, a, a number of things. We set science-based target initiative in 2017 with the first Australian company to do that. Under these targets, what we said was we would um, reduce our direct emissions, our scope one and scope two, that we would uh, halve those by 2032, and I'll come back to the reason for that, and also that we would uh, reduce our scope three emissions by 25% by that time. We said we would exit coal-fired generation by 2032. We only have the one coal plant, but it's a large plant. And, um, and also then we said we would, um, and we would also increase our renewable generation in 2016 we've underpinned the development of about 1200 megawatts of new generation uh, from renewables, which is large scale solar and wind. Um, and that will be uh, by the end of this calendar year, I think 25% of our generation capacity. So we really are making sure we invest in those. Um, and that is part of a broader, as you say, um, we've been longstanding supporters of a net zero emissions for that electricity sector by 2050. Um, one of the things about that is that, that 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 balance that Paula spoke about earlier of how do we manage both affordability while we remain on this path is that a lot of people would say, or some people might say, well, can you go faster than that? And we really do explore that every single day. Um, and one of the key things for us really is the coal plant timing of coming out is really a delicate balance between um, the affordability issue. And we've actually seen coal plant come out early. So even it's an ongoing dialogue with governments about how to manage that coming out. And that will be by far and away the biggest um, thing that we can do to reduce our scope one um, emissions. But very much, um, um, I think, you know, that is, as I said to you earlier, I think the transition's accelerating um, and that we would continue to do all of those things, I think, to, to, to support 
what I believe is our role overall and uh, in achieving um, emissions reduction that goes towards climate change. Um, I'll, I'll uh, just chime in a, a bit. I mean, it is um, a challenge for us relative to hurricanes and um, and interestingly, you know, we the way I look at San Antonio again, we have um, you know, we're the seventh largest city in, in the United States, and we have a full spectrum of believers and uh, or customers. Uh, some people, a lot of people increasingly are believing in climate change. I have some that don't believe in climate change, and I still serve them. Uh, but I tell them, we, we in one year, we experienced tornadoes, uh, floods, uh, you know, you know, that were just remnants of hurricanes hurricanes, um, and we had snow and black ice all in one year in Texas, which in San Antonio, which I grew, I'm born here and raised here. You, you know, you hardly ever see snow, let alone all of those formations, but we predominantly get um, affected by hurricanes. And much to, to what where Frank was going, we look at it both in terms of how do you deal with the fact that this is a global deal. And even for every single um, community or part of the world that's working on it, um, it's gonna take time because every, every bit of effort isn't um, absolute, it's incremental. And so we think about how do we respond? So where our digital solutions around our AMI meters have given us a tremendous amount of ability to at least respond better in terms of storm activity, to be able to proactively call customers, to be able to diagnose the issue and tell them what it is and when we believe that we will get on and then follow up. I mean, there's still the personalization of energy that's really important. So using your data and your sensor technology to do that better service gives your customers a lot better um, belief that the that the energy company is a partner with it, within that. Back to what we talked about earlier, there, there are going to be additional digital solutions that give us more data to tell us where the floods are, to give us more information um, to, to focus on safety, to be able to reroute traffic, to be able to do um, all different types of things associated with things that are brought on by um, natural disasters and those imprints. It's still, in turn, we've got to get into and, and proactive and get in front of it. I mean, we're, you know, are we late? We're, we're, we're not done. We have to keep finding those solutions that Frank was talking about and thinking about the things that we can contribute. We're probably closer to the 40, 45 percent contributor of um, emissions, but we've reduced them tremendously for us. The bit right behind us is transportation and where a room was going before we really want to, one of our next objectives um, is to try to create a um, attraction to bring in more infrastructure around EVs in San Antonio. And I'll, I'll give you this one little analogy though. I mean, it is a delicate balance in trying to figure it out um, because look, you have to think now about the ability to keep the power on so that you can get and keep your car charged enough to get away from a storm. <laughs> and so thinking about systems and backup systems and, and thinking thoughtfully about how do you partner with companies that are going to help us put the best systems out there in terms of EV uh, infrastructure, chargeability, long, long charges on vehicles, you know, really expanding the distance capabilities on electric vehicles, all of those things we're trying to think about it again in the real term. And then where should we be going and how fat, how much faster can we go um, in terms of new technology in the future? Thank you so much. That's, it's a really hard problem and those are really helpful answers. Um, your answer about EVs actually leads into one of the other questions we had from a student, which is when we talk about targets that have 50% or higher penetration of EVs, um, people talk about the challenges and benefits that could pose to electricity systems. Um, what do you think it will take to make your systems ready to support that kind of penetration? And what are some of the challenges? I mean, oh, I... I will jump in real quick and then turn it over to Frank. I mean, again, it's it's um, it's not just the, the ability to supply and to push the power two ways and all these things. You got to have the infrastructure, that expertise on the infrastructure, where the charging stations are, are they at homes? Are they are they you know? Can you get as much infrastructure as you do with gas um, gasoline uh, uh, stations, gas stations? That type of of investment and that type of 
moving the technology along and making it a really economical investment for people who are really good at that, I think we've got to create more of the access for them. So we, we feel like we've got the power thing that we know that we, we're going to be able to move it um, and help people think about building codes as a room, talk to those kind of things to help retrofits that and rebates and all of that. But we've got to get a lot more people who have that expertise to keep pushing that industry to get that infrastructure in. Yeah. So from, from my perspective, I think the key thing that will, in addition to what Paul has said, is that really the integrated system planning around transmission and distribution as well, as we start seeing a proliferation of greater uh, what you would describe as storage assets sitting in the system as well. So I actually think that's probably the key, um, the key challenge that will be over time as more and more EVs come into the system in addition to what, um, in addition to Paula's challenge. So I think that, that that's probably the key, the key thing from my perspective over time. Um, I do see it, by the way, the proliferation, but it'll be that that's the key, the, the key other step on the way. Thank you. So just one more quick question from the student questions. Um, we've talked a bit about integration of renewables, but people often say that 80% is a lot more challenging than 50%. So what are some of the breakthroughs that you think are needed to reach 80%, either technological, regulatory, business-related breakthroughs to get to that challenge? Yeah. I'll go first and then I'll hand over to Paul. It probably extends from my previous answer that when we start seeing more and more renewables being built, what it happens is that that, that that system planning about where it's located, the transition and then the distribution that's sitting alongside it so that it doesn't get constrained and that's efficient and that it can be enabled. I think that's one of the key steps. The second step is one that we've covered previously, which I'll just quickly mention, and that is that with um, new build for renewables being the cheapest form of new build, um, what really will be the constraining factor from our perspective is that there's enough of that firming capacity. And um, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that people were clear that the colder renewables means um, from our perspective, there is definitely gas fired generation in our market. It's all peaking capacity and it will still play a key role. But I believe that that is the, the key in our, in our case in Australia, that's the key challenge that must be addressed to support the intermittent nature of renewables as it continues to get built. And I think that's quite a, that's quite a large investment challenge alongside renewables that needs to be supported. They were the, the two key areas. Um, and if that planning is right, and, that the, and there will be advancement in technology, so I'm really confident it'll be a suite of technologies over time, it'll be that there's the right signals for that investment to support it over time so that customers, um, um, we balance that affordability on the way through. Yeah, that's the key for me. If I pull on uh, Frank's thread though, and this part's not always, um, it, it's not you know as, as easy to kind of articulate, but um, the, the thing that when I talk to um, commissioners across the, the United States, they absolutely are concerned about, you know, the affordability aspect for customers. They want to keep prices down and yep. controllable with little, you know, as little volatility as possible. And, and I, we, we agree. I mean, we think that's a great opportunity and the renewable pricing has come down for us. Gas as well has basically kept, you know, yep. put the, the price of power at a very, very affordable rate. But that the, the challenge is when you're trying to put on, the technology that you need to smooth out that transition to go to a whole lot more renewables and and the system optimization that has to happen so that the power is resilient and reliable requires as frank said investments now our historical investment um hurdles and investment horizons horizons have been 50, 60, in some cases, 80 years. When you can do that and optimize an asset over time, when you make that investment, you can you can find a way to you know to eke out a business and smooth out the cost. What's going to happen are these investments are going to require shorter time periods to recover that investment. And and if prices are suppressed though for new entrants, for people who want to bring in new solutions, non-emitting solutions, they have to have enough incentive to make those investments in the system. And so 
in reality, either you got to have that or again, you have to have so much federal funding so, to support and smooth out those things that it works for, for your community. But you put that in line with every other thing that causes a deficit in your federal budget and trying to figure that out again so that it has the least amount of impact on your customers is a really complicated thing. So, so it still matters and that transition piece isn't a, isn't a snap of the finger. Um, it isn't, isn't a declaration of we're gonna just get there those intermittent things that happen, those signals that are sent, those the capacity payments that happen that help smooth in new technology is is a pretty complicated thing. And in some places, we we may be we may be suppressing market forces to try to keep low prices when in fact we need to let a little bit more market force come in to incent technology. And, and maybe the piece that helps again is partnerships with tech companies and other companies that want to get, um, you know, optimized with utility companies. So, but there's so many moving parts to make that happen. I, but that's important to get renewables optimized. They're just not resilient enough by themselves. They have to have that firming capacity and that investment incentive has to be there for it. Thank you so much. On behalf of all the students who sent in questions, thank you for taking the time to answer them. It was really interesting. Um, and now I have to pass it back to Arun. <laughs> thank you, Shaman. Great job. Great job. <laughs> so now, now we are in the last, um, you know, the home stretch uh, with questions from the um, audience. And let me ask, uh, we, I'm going to combine a few and ask them. There, there are a few questions on trust. And both of you have mentioned this. And I'm going to parse it out into two parts. One is the trust with your customers. And the question is, which programs have worked or have not worked in establishing customer trust? But there's another part of the trust that I'm going to add to this. And that is, you all mentioned digital is a big deal. And you want to pursue digital. But there's a trust in that in terms of cyber uh, as well, protecting data. and the, your customers are entrusting you with a lot of data, but at the same time, we know that uh, data is also precious and we are surrounded by companies out here where people don't always trust the data with them. So how do you preserve, how do you build the trust? How do you preserve it with your customers? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, um, you know, there's a, one, we, we have a philosophy. So we don't sell our data uh, at all. Um, you know, they, look, there, there's, there's clearly the, even concerns. Some customers will call us and say, I, I don't want you selling our data or giving it to anyone because my usage patterns might dictate what, you know, whether I'm home, let alone what I'm doing, right? Um, they sometimes a, a customer, I haven't had this question in a long time. Some customers think that there's so much data that the, that, you know, the energy company is monitoring that's not what we're doing at all. We're, we're, we're aggregating data and we don't sell it. And so we're constantly telling people we don't. Um, and we think as a municipal, we need to stay in that, that safe place to make sure that customers know that's where we start from, that we don't sell it. Now, it's fascinating to me that um, at a tech company, we'll have an app and everybody in the world does it. And I do it, I go get an app and they'll say, do you agree? Because I'm going to use your, I'm going to look at your cookies. I'm going to watch what you do and I'm going to keep your data and I'm going to do what you want. And you say, I agree. Just like that. Just like that. Because you want to utilize the app. And so interestingly, there's this weird place for utilities where a lot of people don't want their utility company to do things like that. And while we're comfortable, what we do believe is that customers will share data or will allow their data to be shared if they know what it's going to be used for. And if they, like a lot of people, what we find have a higher calling, they'll go up, yeah, I'll, I'll opt into that if the utility company is gonna work with another company that's gonna help us optimize uh, building, building design for codes and reduce the use of consumption. You gotta figure out how to do that you know, quickly, but, but people will opt in. So our only strategy is trust us, we're not gonna give it to anyone. But when you want to partner with us and when you want to come into our smart cities initiatives and you opt in 
this is how we're going to utilize and, and um, optimize your information. And we take off all the, you know, we also make the commitment to take off all the, the unique information, um, IDs, names, um, those kind of things. So, so for us, we have to keep building it, reinforcing, talking about it, and again, clearly make sure that people know we have a limit. So some, sometimes we have other partners that come to us and say they want utility information and we decline and we say, no, we just don't give it out. Just, you know, it's gotta be a very um, optimal purpose to help a customer and they have to knowingly know that and they have to opt into it. Yeah. Frank, I'm From sure you've thought about this. <laughs> yeah, I've thought about it long. Um, so firstly, I think trust is, there's a fundamental piece before that about what does it take you to actually earn it over time as, um, someone that is with your customers all of the time and doing the right thing. You know, that might be product services, pricing, um, supporting them through change, hardship. There's a whole range, loyalty. They're all foundational elements. And I believe they're some, in some ways the hardest to earn. Then when you go into digital, I think the first thing is privacy. I mean, privacy is just incredibly crucial. Um, and uh, we're all responding to a higher and higher standard every single day in terms of protecting the data for millions of our customers. Cybersecurity is ingrown in significantly um, importance as data has become more important to run the business. Cybersecurity in twofold, not only for the physical operating assets, because that's become obviously a key um, area of focus, but obviously when we get to, to, to um, the cybersecurity more broadly with our customer data. And I think as I th we think a bit about that, that trend earlier that takes us into higher um, an, an internet of things world, more distributed assets connected, we're not gonna be able to put a wall around security the way we might've historically thought about it. So we're going to need to embrace new technologies and I'm happy to call out that one of the companies we've invested in is based in your part of the world called Intertrust that has digital rights. And so we think increasingly we will need to be innovative in terms of the way we think about security if we're going to actually continue to offer products and services that are historically got you engaging more with people's devices in their homes, their smart meter and a, and a broader set of community assets. So there's going to be new capabilities that need to emerge with that. To Paula's point, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I talk about citizenship will be a corporate um, uh, it will be a source of competitive advantage over time is that we really need to put a lens on what do we believe will be the expectations of our customers that we're on that journey with them over time. And I think that we've really got to say what is the right thing um, to do and should we do that. Um, they're important questions and I think they've never been more important in, in society than today. And I think that we've got to take great care and, uh, and we, we could easily lose that trust if we make the wrong calls along the way. So I have to say of all of the excitement that comes with this journey comes a great responsibility. And um, I think one of the things you can look to is the history of organizations and know what it takes to protect and support customers as a guiding light, uh, but also to know that there'll be capabilities that you'll need to bring in expertise and invest in through partners like we have as well. Great. Uh, so we have a minute, a few minutes for the last question. And this is, I'm, I'm picking this one because I think we are all are trying to figure this out. You know, the question is, how are we going to live post COVID-19? I mean, I don't know about you. I, I get pretty sick and tired of sitting in front of a computer all day long. <laughs> and mm. and when, when we get vaccinated, I want to go out and go to a bar or go, mm. go to work and meet my colleagues. Uh, but I'll probably be traveling less because I think I've figured this out now that I could do international things much easier this way. And we probably live in a hybrid world. So, so what is your perspective on what the world is likely to be post COVID-19, right immediately, a little bit longer after that? Will it die out to go back to the same normal that we had? Um, and how, what does that imply on the energy industry? What implication does it have in the energy industry? Frank, you want to go for it? I'm happy to go first. I'll, I'll stay clear of whether you go to the bar before you go to see your colleagues or on and just focus on the work environment, okay, because uh, we'll all be doing different things, I'm sure. But um, from my perspective, I thought about the future ways of working and as an organisation, it's probably easier than thinking about where I'll be going socially. But I, I actually think that we've forever changed. I don't think we're going back to where we were. And I think partly that's the fact that 
I think what we've accelerated is what's what can be done when you don't have an opt-in, when you have the only ability to opt out. I think what we've seen is we've accelerated change. So I, I personally believe we'll be in a in, in a hybrid form of working going forward where we flexibility will be a combination of both people working remotely and working from the office. Uh, the technology will be managing on the basis that there'll always be someone engaging with you technologically and maybe not physically. Um, but what I what I think around that though is that we need to actually preserve culture and affiliation along the way. So I don't see a pure world one way or the other in your reflection or on is, is a is a case in point that there's still that I don't think we can think that this is purely affiliative all the way and that it will be contained and cultural organizations will need to be preserved. So I definitely think though that we'll be we'll be in a in a far more flexible and hybrid form of organization, but um, and I believe there'll be less travel internally for work. Uh, there'll be less need for that. And I think that's, and people have welcomed many, many of those changes. So I think we'll be preserving a number of those things going forward. Um, but yeah, so, but I do think that there'll be some things that we'll want to balance compared to where we are today. That's my personal view. And I, I genuinely believe uh, there'll be a new social contract, I think, with employees. Um, I think honestly about how do we think about that, that it will be founded on trust, um, but it'll also be how does the team, the individual and the organisation work together. I think that's quite an exciting opportunity, but I don't think we should say that that's an easy thing for us to, to, to balance. And I think that we'll, we'll end up going forward on that way. And I think that's, I mean, that, that's got some excitement to it. There are a lot of our employees that are telling us that there are some things that we'd love to preserve and how do we get the balance of that right? Yeah. I'll try to make mine really quick. I, I think we have been changed. I don't think it goes back to the way it was. We are building a new, um, we, we are taking a brownfield site that had been abandoned for decades and we're rebuilding it in part of um, San Antonio. And our goal was to put, you know, I guess 1500 or so employees in that, in that building. But I, you know, what I'm telling folks is I'm not going to force people to come back just to come mm. back and make it look yeah. like it was. Right. I want people to be flexible. I want them to be able to feel comfortable that they can work from home and um, when they need to come into the office to come in. And I also encourage them to feel, to not anchor even in the office, like, like, Treat it like hoteling. If you want to be on the, the first floor today, but you want to be on the fifth floor tomorrow and you want to spread out and you want to, you want to be creative, we want our, our facility to feel more um, flexible, just like our flexible path strategy. So we believe that. And I don't think travel will be as much, but I do think people have figured out right before COVID, the world was everything was available. You could go all the way across the world and go to Australia and study and, and, and uh, appreciate. And I still think as a human being, that's still an attractive thing. So I think travel will be more about yeah. pleasure once we get the safety element down and business will do a lot better with, with not having to travel as much. However, we're doing a big global RFP. We want people to bring us technology. So we'll have to figure it out. We ultimately are going to have to create those most important streams of, of connection to really make sure that we get these, these um, implementations that are seamless um, and that there's enough trust between partners that are across the globe. So it'll be different, but I think actually we'll have probably be more effective with our time. Well, to all my colleagues, how about if I say that I'll go to the bar, but I'll see you at the bar. Yeah, then I, think right. be, I won't be crucified by my colleagues, but let's end with, uh, let's uh, give a big round of applause to, to Paula and Frank. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to Thank all you. of you joining us from around the world, we hope you found today's Global Energy Dialogue informative and relevant during these unprecedented times. Now, please join us two weeks from now on August 18th for a conversation with Don Evans, the 34th U.S. Secretary of Commerce, who served under President George W. Bush, um, who is also a Texan, and he has been a longtime thought leader in the energy industry. We will explore with him the energy transition going on in different parts of the world and its impact on trade, on geopolitics, and international security in the 21st century. Again, please register on our website, gef.stanford.edu, and note that the date and time, August 18th, 8.30 to 10 a.m. California time, and on behalf of the entire Stanford Precord Institute for Energy, we thank the students and all, all our audience 
joining us today. Paul and Frank, thank you so much. Thank you, Arun. Have a nice day, everyone. Be safe. <laughs> Same to you.